I'd ask if you would please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Uh, it's page 874 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. Acts 20, page 874 in the Pew Bible. If you have uh, been with us in recent weeks, you know that we are in the midst of a sermon series on the local church. The series is called One Body, Church Government for God's Glory and the Advancement of His Kingdom. You remember we be began with a sermon from 1 Corinthians 12 on the importance of church membership. We then looked at the necessity of elders from Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. And so this morning, we want to continue looking at the office of elder. Specifically, we want to turn our attention to the nature of elder ministry. Who are elders? What do they do? What is the nature of their ministry within the local church? And there are several places that we could go in the New Testament to kind of try to answer these questions, but I think none better than Acts 20 and Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. So Acts chapter 20, uh, I'm going to read verses 17 through 38. Acts 20, beginning in verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I co coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Would you pray with me? And Father, we thank you this morning uh, for your word. We thank you again for the privilege that you have given us of gathering together in your name to, to worship you through song, to give of our offerings to you and father also to hear from your word to open this book that you have given to us your word and and see what it is that you would have to say to us this morning so god we pray that you would give us eyes to see we pray that you give us ears to hear we pray god that you would help us 
Give us understanding of your word. We pray, God, that you would not only help us to be hearers of your word, but doers as well. Continue to conform us more and more to the image of your son, Jesus, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. We know that the Apostle Paul spent about three years ministering in Ephesus. He preached in the synagogue there, and then when he was run out of the synagogue, he continued preaching in the hall of Tyrannus. And then eventually he was run out of Ephesus altogether, but not until there was a church that was established there in that city. We have only one chapter in the Bible, Acts 19, to describe three years of ministry in Ephesus. So we don't have a lot of details about Paul's church planting work in Ephesus. Mainly, we just know that he preached the gospel there. As a result of his preaching the gospel, people came to faith in Christ. And as a result of people coming to faith in Christ, a church was established there in Ephesus. But apparently, planting a church in Ephesus included training and appointing elders for the church. We know this from Acts 20, because after Paul left Ephesus, he traveled around the region preaching the message of the gospel, leading people to faith in Christ, encouraging Christians. And eventually he decided that he was going to return to Jerusalem. He didn't have time to stop in Ephesus on the way, but the Ephesian church was on his mind. And so while in Miletus, Before departing for Jerusalem, Paul called for the Ephesian elders to come and to meet him in Miletus. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Paul's circumstances created a situation where he could minister to the Ephesian church from a distance. So what did he do? How did he go about ministering to this church from a distance? He called for the elders of the church and he invested in them. From Paul's perspective, the best way for him to bless the Ephesian church was for him to pour in to the lives of the church's elders. And his speech to them here in Acts 20 helps us to develop an understanding of the nature of elder ministry. And so I want to share with you this morning three statements concerning the nature of elder ministry in the local church. Three statements concerning the nature of elder ministry in the local church. Number one, elders are examples to the church. Elders are examples to the church. If you look at this speech here in Acts 20, you see that in his speech to the Ephesian elders, Paul appeals to his own example among them. In verse 18, he says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. He's setting before them his own example, and he's saying to them here, follow this. The Ephesian elders had seen his life up close and personal during his approximately three years in Ephesus. Now understand that Paul was not drawing their attention to his ministry among them so that they would look at him and praise him and think, look at you, Paul, you're so wonderful, look how great you are. Rather, he was drawing their attention to his ministry among them so that they would follow his example. This is similar to what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11.1 where he says, follow me as I follow Christ. You see, if the Ephesian elders were going to be faithful to the call of God on their lives, they would need to follow Paul's example of faithful service. But notice also that in appealing to his own example, Paul is teaching the Ephesian elders that they themselves are to live as examples to the church. You've heard the saying, do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work for elder ministry. Elders are examples to the church. In fact, this is why character matters so much for elders. You remember two weeks ago when we looked at the character qualifications that Paul gives for elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. You remember we said that they are really just normal Christian character traits. And that's the point. Elders should live as examples of Christ-likeness to the church. 
You've heard the saying, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Maybe you've asked yourself that question. You've been in a situation, you're trying to make a decision uh, about how to act, how to, how to live, and you say, what would Jesus do? Well, God's people shouldn't have to look very far to know how Jesus would live if he were present as a man here on earth today. They should be able to look to their elders as an example of Christ's likeness. That doesn't mean that elders are sinless like Jesus. Certainly they're not. But they should be pursuing Christ's likeness. They should be living lives in such a way that they can say to the, to the congregation, follow me as I follow Christ. So what are some ways that Paul was an example to the Ephesian elders that serve as a model for the way that elders today should live as examples to the churches that they lead? Number one, elders are to live as examples in humility. Elders are to live as examples in humility. Look at uh, verse 19 of, Ephi or of Acts 20. Verse 19, Paul says, Serving the Lord with all humility. You see, the fact that elders are to live as examples to the church shouldn't puff them up. Rather, it should humble them. In fact, we know that pride is a disqualifier for serving as an elder. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 7 that an elder must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Interestingly enough, this call to humility is not unique for elders. Because as Christians, we follow the one who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, the call for humble service to the Lord Jesus Christ is for all believers. The elders should lead as examples of what it looks like in the local church. Number two, elders are to live as examples in gospel boldness. Elders are to live as examples in gospel boldness. Look at verses 20 and 21. Paul says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, ministry in Ephesus wasn't easy for Paul. He was kicked out of the synagogue. He was eventually forced to leave the city altogether after a riot. But he did not shrink back from preaching and teaching God's word. He taught in public. He taught in private. He preached to Jews. He preached to Gentiles. What did he proclaim to them? Repentance toward God and a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a whole deal, isn't it? Turn from your sin and place your trust in Jesus. Friends, when I come to the end of my ministry, I want to be able to say, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. This is one of the primary reasons that the normal preaching diet of our church is preaching through books of the Bible. When we come to a difficult passage, we don't skip over it. We wrestle with it. We seek to understand what the Lord desires to communicate to us in that passage. And I'm never going to apologize to you for what God has said in his word. Because brothers and sisters, every word of it is true. And every word of it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I don't have the authority to edit God's word. God has only given me the authority to declare it. And Paul understood this reality. Look at verses 26 and 27. He wrote, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Brothers and sisters, elders must not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. 
And in declaring the whole counsel of God, they set an example for God's church of gospel boldness. Number three, elders are to live as examples in obedience to God. Look at, look at verse 22. Paul says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. What mattered most to Paul? Not his personal safety, not how other people viewed him. What mattered most to Paul was obedience to God. God has given us his word, hasn't he? He has told us what he requires of us. He has given us his spirit. He has dwelt us with his spirit. And elders must live as examples in obedience to God. Number four, elders are to live as examples in unwavering trust in God. Unwavering trust in God. Paul could obey God with confidence because he trusted God. It, it wasn't that life and ministry for Paul was easy. In fact, verse 23 says that the Holy Spirit had indicated to him that imprisonment and affliction awaited him in Jerusalem. Paul didn't know exactly what awaited him. He just knew it was going to be hard. But he trusted God. He had an unwavering confidence in the God who saved him and called him to be an apostle. Friends, ministry is hard. Life is hard. Being, being a Christian is hard. So, some of the best elders are those who lead with a limp. But they lead with an unwavering trust in God. And in doing so, they live as an example to God's church. But not only are elders examples to the church, elders provide oversight of and care for the church. Elders provide oversight of and care for the church. But before they do that, notice what Paul says. They must pay careful attention to themselves. They must pay careful attention to themselves. Paul tells the Ephesian elders in verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves. This means, of course, that each elder must keep a close watch on his own life. This is similar to Paul's instruction to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, where he wrote, keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching. Which again reminds us of the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Elders are to be godly men who are above reproach. One of the most important things these elders could do was pay careful attention to themselves, lest they disqualify themselves from being elders and thus bring reproach to God's church. Elders should never think that they have risen above some particular sin or have attained some kind of immunity to various temptations. Elders must always be on their guard. Elders must be keenly aware of the truth of the old hymn, Come Thou Fount, where it states, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And since that is true, elders must pray the next two lines, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. A.W. Tozer said, do you know who gives me the most trouble? Do you know who I pray for the most in my pastoral work? Just myself. Each elder must keep a close watch on his own life. But notice this, church. Paul tells the group of elders, pay careful attention to yourselves. He doesn't merely say, let each of you pay careful attention to himself. He says to all of them, collectively, however many there were, pay careful attention to yourselves. And friends, this is the beauty of plural elder ministry. Notice at the beginning of our text in verse 17 that the word elders is plural. The Ephesian church had multiple elders. And this is a pattern that we see throughout the New Testament. And so the elders shepherd the congregation, and we're going to see that in a moment. But who shepherds an elder? The other elders. No elder should be siloed off on his own. As much as you need to be shepherded or pastored, so do your elders. 
And that responsibility doesn't rest in the denomination or some kind of system of hierarchy as in other church traditions. The responsibility of shepherding each elder rests on the elders together as they pay careful attention to themselves. And as the elders pay careful attention to themselves, they are able to pay careful attention to all the flock. Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Now, Paul loves using metaphors for the church, doesn't he? We saw in 1 Corinthians 12 that he talks about the church as the body. Here in Acts 20, he talks about the church as a flock. A flock of what? A flock of sheep, right? Here in Acts 20, also in Ephesians 4 and in 1 Peter 5, are the places where we get the term pastor or shepherd to describe elder ministry. Remember I told you when we looked at 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 that the terms elder and pastor are synonymous in the New Testament. They describe the same office. An elder is a pastor. A pastor is an elder. And what does a shepherd do? He cares for the sheep. Not only do we pick up the term pastor or shepherd to describe elder ministry, we also pick up the term overseer. Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Remember that overseer is the term that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 3 when he gives the qualifications for elders. He also uses overseer in the elder qualifications in Titus in verse 7. So again, elder and overseer are synonymous in the New Testament. They describe the same office. An elder is an overseer, is a pastor. Elders provide oversight of and care for the church. We see in verses 29 and 30 that one of the ways that elders provide oversight of and care for the church is by protecting her from false teachers. Continuing his metaphor of the church as a flock of sheep, he refers to false teachers as fierce wolves. Just as a shepherd protects his sheep from wolves, so do elders protect God's church from false teachers. But before we move on, I want to draw your attention to two more things in verse 28. In the middle of verse 28, Paul says, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, we saw in 1 Timothy 3 the importance of those who serve God's church as elders actually desiring or aspiring to the office. Paul says if anyone aspires to be an elder or, or desires the office of elder. We also know that the congregation has a role to play in identifying and selecting elders. And we're going to talk about that more in this series. But here we see that it is ultimately the Holy Spirit who calls a man to the office of elder and gives him oversight of a local church. No one should presume to serve God's church as an elder without the call of God on his life. Ephesian elders have been called by God to the office of elder. I also want you to notice that Paul refers to the church of God obtained with his own blood. Brothers and sisters, let us never forget to whom the church belongs. It's not the elders, not the deacons, not even the congregation. The Ephesian church belonged to God. And I want to say to you this morning that Goshen Baptist Church belongs to God. Let us never think that this church belongs to us. This isn't my church. This isn't your church. It is God's church. Jesus purchased this church with his own blood. And apart from Christ, brothers and sisters, there would be no church. We were lost and dead in our sins. We were separated from God. We were going our own way. We were pursuing our own interests, satisfying our own desires. But God intervened on our behalf. He sent his son Jesus to come to this earth to live a sinless life. Brothers and sisters, the sinless life that you have not lived, the sinless life that you could not live. Have you tried? <laughs> you don't measure up. You, you can't perfectly obey God's law. 
But Jesus came and he perfectly obeyed God's law on your behalf. And then he went to Calvary's cross and he died to pay for our sin. He took our sin on himself. He died as our substitute in our place, experiencing the punishment of God for our sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That what you deserve and I deserve because of our sin is death. Separation from God forever. We deserve hell. Jesus died in our place to save us, to redeem us out of our sin, and to establish a people for himself, which we call the church. It's only because of Jesus that this church or any other church exists. He is the one who has redeemed us. We are his. This is God's church. Elders are examples to the church. Elders provide oversight of and care for the church. And number three, elders pour themselves out for the Lord and his people. Elders pour themselves out for the Lord and his people. This is the example that Paul left behind for the Ephesian elders. Look at verse uh, 31 of Acts 20. Paul says, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Paul ministered in Ephesus for three years and by his own testimony and with the Ephesian elders as his witnesses, he did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. Paul knew what it was like to give of himself for the sake of the gospel and God's people. It wasn't easy. We saw in verse 19 that Paul faced trials throughout his ministry in Ephesus. But he pressed forward, pouring himself out for the Lord and his people. Notice the sacrifice that Paul made financially so that he could serve the Lord and his people. Look at verse 33. Paul says, I coveted no one, silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We know that at times during his ministry, Paul received financial support. But other times, as it seems he did in Ephesus, he worked a secular job to support himself. But regardless, no one could argue that Paul was in it for the money. And there's no hint of bitterness on the part of the Apostle Paul. He willingly and joyfully gave up the success and the prestige that the world may have afforded him so that he could proclaim the matchless name of Jesus. You remember that Paul told Timothy that elders must not be lovers of money. He told Titus that they must not be greedy for gain. There's no vow of poverty in the Bible. In fact, Paul wrote to Timothy, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. But elders must not be consumed by financial gain. Elders must have one consuming passion, and that is to make Christ known. And as they lay their lives down for the cause of Christ, they should remember that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Brothers and sisters, really that's true for all of us, isn't it? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. Our consuming passion as Christians should be to make Christ known whatever the cost. I want to make two additional notes before we conclude. The first is that elder ministry is sweet. Elder ministry is sweet. Notice the love that Paul and these Ephesian elders shared with one another. Look at verses 36 to 38. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Elder ministry is weighty. Elder ministry is hard sometimes. Sometimes it requires sacrifice. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that elder ministry is also sweet. 
As Christians, we all have the ability to impact people's lives for all of eternity. But elders get the opportunity to do that in a unique way. And as they do, a special bond is developed between an elder and the congregation that he serves. We see that here with the Apostle Paul in the Ephesian church. In just three years of ministry among them, Paul had developed such a strong bond with these Ephesian elders. Paul loved them and they loved him. Christian family, I want you to know of my great love for you. It is my joy to be able to serve you as one of your elders. I echo the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, where he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus. Elder ministry is sweet. But I also want you to know that elder ministry is temporary. Elder ministry is temporary. Notice in Acts 20, that this is a goodbye. Luke records that Paul was sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. This was goodbye. Paul would not see these Ephesian elders again in this life. He had ministered among them for three years. He was here pouring into their lives one last time, but he would never see them again. That's why in verse 32, he says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You know, Goshen Baptist Church long preceded every one of us. And if Christ should tarry, I pray it will long outlast us as well. That includes me. It includes the other elders as well. Our, our ministry among you is only temporary. It will one day come to an end. But that's okay. It reminds each one of us that it was never about us to begin with. We can trust this church to the Lord Jesus. After all, it is his church anyway. And he is more than able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Elder ministry is temporary. But I want you to know this morning that the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, he will rule and reign forever. So what is the nature of elder ministry? Simply pointing people to Jesus. It's directing the gaze of God's people to eternity. It won't last forever. I won't last forever on this earth. You won't last forever either. Goshen Baptist Church won't last forever. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the kingdom of our God will last forever. Our God will rule and reign forever. And by repentance of sin and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the promise of being with him forever in his kingdom. That's our blessed hope.